Uh, thanks so much for having me and thanks for the organizers for putting this awesome conference together. Fantastic to be here in person. And I'm excited to present um, joint work with uh, Jörg Heining, Holger Seibert, Maria Polyakova and Roman Klimke. Um, in the past, I've, just as a background, I've worked a bit on uh, the nursing home industry, thought about how nursing homes compete um, over the quality of staffing, um, with a more of a focus on market power questions and product market regulations. Today, we're shifting the focus on labor markets. Um, and, you know, future agendas obviously want to pull those and think about frictions in both of these markets. But today is going to have more of a spin on the, on the labor markets and the frictions that are there. Um, so let me start with a motivation. So the textbook model of health insurance expansions um, highlights the key or fundamental trade-off between financial risk protection on the one hand and moral hazard on the other. However, health insurance is also effectively an industrial policy, right? We subsidize healthy consumption, we pour significant resources into the healthcare sector, and that's how we think about it today as an industrial policy, and it may lead to a substantial reallocation of factors of production between sectors, but potentially also within sectors. Now, these aggregate effects, they may be very large, particularly when we think about sweeping long-term care or health insurance expansions more broadly, have been hard to capture empirically. The gold standards in the literature look at a RAND experiment or the Oregon experiment where we treat 10, 20,000 people and sort of supply side expansion responses will be very different as opposed to when we think about a universal sweeping health insurance rollout. So very little evidence on this and we try to provide some facts on this, whether that's important. And more importantly, and also related, um, we don't know yet how potential frictions in these input markets may mediate the factor relocation between markets from a positive standpoint and also thinking about the normative implications. If there are frictions in input markets, we know going back to Harberger that in the theory of the second best, we need to take these frictions or these wedges into account when we're going to make normative welfare statements. Okay? So today we want to do two things. First, we want to quantify these reallocation effects of healthcare, of a key input to healthcare, which is labor. So we're talking about labor workforce in response to a sweeping and very large health insurance expansion. Okay? I'm going to provide the first part of the talk to provide just some key facts on what happened. And second, um, the remaining minutes, I'm going to offer a conceptual framework that allows us to map these moments into welfare relevant numbers and incorporating potential frictions and wedges in these input markets. Okay? Let me tell you about our setting, the context that we study. We study a very sweeping long-term care insurance reform in Germany, one of its kind. There are only a few worldwide of uh, comparable magnitude. Um, so what happened in 95, 96, um, Germany rolled out universal long-term care insurance coverage, uh, funded largely through um, uh, payroll contributions. And the key thing here is that eligibility is not means-tested, not dependent on your financial needs, it's dependent on your medical needs. Okay? Um, these people then get very generous benefits, um, and it's not a free ride, so they still have implicit cost sharing of 40 to 50%, but keep in mind that most people were first paying everything out of pocket and then going down to 40 to 50 percent. So this had massive implications for public spending. Public spending on long-term care tripled instantly from 5 to 15 billion or about 0.2 to 0.6 percent of, of, of GDP, right? So what was the, where are we, where are we coming from? Uh, prior to this, the system was more similar to the U.S. We had means-tested um, public support for long-term care called Hilfe zur Pflege. Think of this as Medicaid in the US, right? And so instead now we go from Medicaid only to having a universal insurance coverage for everybody who needs, who has medical needs, okay? Another thing that I want to highlight is the market at the time was um, dominated by public but mostly not-for-profit firms, church-owned providers. And what's interesting about those, and I'm going to highlight those later, is they set their wages through collective bargaining agreements. And um, we'll, we'll talk a bit about how that may distort sort of the, the employment decisions in, in that industry. Okay, so to make progress, particularly on these descriptive effects, we're going to leverage um, very rich employer-employee match data from Germany um, over the universe of socially insured workers, spanning more than 30 years, so a very long time window. Um, we're going to see the industry that these workers uh, work in, the occupations, earnings, um, full, part-time, several of the worker characteristics. And today we're going to use the industry code to narrow down skilled nursing facilities and we're going to think about employment in these SNFs, skilled nursing facilities that absorb the lion's share of, uh, of workers at the time in, in, in long-term care. So that's on the labor market front. 
We then combine it also, we hand collected from archive in information on eligibility for Hilfe zur Pflege prior to the reform. Those are the days where things were not digitized, so you know, I feel a bit like a historian going to these archives and digging up these reports. But that's important later on for our empirical strategy um, because different regions were differentially affected by the reform based on their initial coverage. I'll come back to this in, in two slides. We also have some data on mortality. Um, I'll get to this hopefully towards the end of the talk. Let me show you a little bit about our sample. Okay, So we cut the sample in two, um, basically two, two analytical samples. The first column, the first column, um, this looks, we call it the SNF sample. This looks at workers who at least at once in their career work in a SNF. Okay? So this gives us 24 million worker year observations or about 1.6 million people, individuals. The second column looks at the spell when they actually do work in the SNF. Right? So this is the entire history, work history of them. It may also include unemployment spells or employment in other careers. Um, this is when they actually do work. And the last one, that's a 10% labor market sample of people aged 25 and older um, that has nothing to do per se with SNFs. And we use this later on to think about spillover effects to other sectors. I'll come back to this. Um, it's a large sample, as you can see. A few things to highlight is sort of that if you do work a SNF, that's going to be ten uh, tends to be later in the career. SNF employment is uh, biased towards women. And these people are generally um, slightly less educated. Um, you see this, they are more likely to have unemployment spells over their work histories and uh, less experience, more likely to work part-time, and as a result, on average at least, get uh, slightly lower wages than if you compare this to sort of a broader represented labor market uh, sample. Okay, let me briefly talk about our research design. It's straightforward. It's a very simple plain vanilla diff and diff. Uh, what we're going to argue is that all of these regions in Germany reached universal coverage after the reform, but they started out from different levels of coverage in the first place, depending on how many people were eligible basically for, for this means tested program, if it's of Lega. Okay? So some regions had very high initial coverage levels and said they were less affected by the reform, whereas other regions had very low initial levels, so they saw large increases in coverage. Okay? So different regions in Germany were differentially exposed to the reform that all happened at the same time, and we're going to exploit that variation in our research design. So what happens? Let me show you some first just raw statistics. Okay, These are just raw counts of uh, workers in skilled nursing facility normalized into a, by a thousand elderly people in the local county, just as a point of reference. And um, I'm plotting two time series here. The blue one is counties that were more than average exposed to the reform. Their exposure was higher than the median exposure across all regions. And in red, we have sort of the low exposure regions. So these regions seem to follow very similar trends between 1975 and 1993. And with the onset of the reform, you see that they diverge, providing first direct evidence that this leads to substantial increase in employment. Right? So this is SNF workers' employment increases. This is one way to cut it. You can also do the full continuous variation. Right? We're not just saying high exposure to low exposure. We can just say, you know, by how much were you exposed? And so that brings us to a very natural uh, event study design. Here we're now comparing regions by their intensity of treatment, so to say. And so here on the right figure is again the SNF workers. Um, again, up until 93, we see relatively parallel trends. And then uh, they see a striking uptick where they converge to a new uh, steady state, so to speak, in 2002. Right? So there are massive, actually massive increases in employment. Interestingly, we also see uh, quite substantial increases in entry. Um, number of firms, average firm size actually increases. The interesting questions around market structure that we haven't explored yet, but um, there is also significant entry of firms. Um, today I'm going to focus on, on employment. These effects are large. One way to put them into perspective is to construct sort of an arc elasticity um, of, um, of when you benchmark these employment gains vis-a-vis -vis to the uh, coverage impact, and so we get an arc elasticity of 0.8. That's significantly higher than what you find in the RAND or the Oregon experiment, potentially in parts because we're looking at a sweeping um, national reform with a very aggregate response on the supply side. Um, great. So we do see very large increases in employment. And so a natural question for us was, you know, what happens to wages? How do these providers attract these workers? And so that brings us to this next slide. Here we just document the effects on full-time workers, on full-time wages. We look at Wages for new hires, starting wages, and we look at wages among incumbents. And what I found very surprising is 
We don't see any evidence for increases in wages. If anything, they seem to fall. They converge uh, closer to zero when, once you control for worker characteristics. That provides some first suggestive evidence that these marginal workers are potentially less skilled. So once you control for skills, um, the wage effects um, increase. But there is no evidence for increase in wages, despite the fact that um, there are massive increases in employment. Okay, so that was to us puzzling, and I'll provide an answer to this later. Getting more directly at the anatomy of these new hires, who are the guys who are joining long-term care because of reform? Um, here we're looking at worker characteristics. And so what's interesting is these people who are now newly hired are less likely to be highly educated, have an Abitur, high A-level uh, education. Um, they have less experience. And um, they are not coming from other sectors necessarily, if so, less so. They're coming from unemployment. And, um, or not in the labor force. Keep in mind, this is a time, I'll come back to this, where Germany had very high unemployment rates, north of 10%, even Western Germany, Eastern Germany, even much, much higher. So it's a time of very high unemployment rates. And so this suggests, first pass is that these new hires were less educated and coming out of unemployment or were not in the labor force uh, in the first place. Now, you might say, sure, these people were unemployed. Perhaps they would have found jobs anyways, even if, had they not joined SNFs. So how can we get at this? And how can we also get better at, um, at these spillover effects? So to get at this, we're going to reverse perspective. Here this is the view from the nursing home asking, you know, what is the composition of new hires? But you can also go to the workers and ask, you know, who are looking at the workers in the, that are not yet hired and ask, how do they change the career tra trajectories if they're hit by local demand shocks, right? That's our thought experiment here, right? We're going to go to the labor market sample and ask people who are not yet working in SNFs. Now we're going to ask if there's a large local demand shock, who's going to change its career paths? Is it unemployed people switching there? Is it workers from other sectors switching there? That's the thought experiment that we want to entertain. There is, though, a key challenge uh, from a measurement standpoint, because a lot of people in the workforce are not really marginal to working in SNFs, right? They are not considering these careers, and so they would water down the results and give us probably a zero result. So we need to work around this, and we need to highlight a relevant risk sample, workers who are not yet working in nursing homes, but have a very high propensity to do so, who are interested, who are sort of searching and thinking about this. How do we do this? Machine learning techniques come to the rescue here, right? So we're going to use machine learning techniques and we're going to use very rich data on these worker histories to characterize which workers may be inclined to work in a nursing home if they were poached or if these nursing homes would make an offer. So we use um, a machine learning techniques to predict from the history what is your propensity to work in a SNF in the future. And then we narrow down the sample to those folks who have a sufficiently high probability of joining. Okay? So this is how this works. In the first column, this is the 10% labor market sample. This is everybody, right? 48 million people. Um, they have a relatively low probability of joining SNFs, right? Because many people pursue careers in other sectors. And so here in the second column, we are now looking at people that, by demographics, demographics are here, um, how were you five years ago? Because those are our predictors. We want to predict are you working in SNFs in period T? And we use as predictors um, information from the history from five years ago. And so here is the second column. You see these people in the risk sample. These people have a much higher probability, 2.6% on average, of joining SNFs in the next five years. And so it's kind of interesting to see how these demographics change, right? So compared to the full population, these people are much more likely to be female. They are more likely to be German. They are um, slightly less educated. They are much more likely to have a history in the medical sector, so that they've worked in healthcare in the past. And they are also much more likely to be unemployed. Okay? Is that clear what we're doing here? This is the full population, 10%. And this is, these are folks who are not yet working in SNFs. But our machine learning model tells us you have a very high chance of working in SNFs in the future. Okay? And so you see that these demographics now resemble very closely to the last column to those guys who actually work in SNF and T, right? So that sees, you see that it closes the gap in these demographics, and that's precisely what we want to pick up. What are we doing now? We're now going to focus on this risk sample, right, and redo the analysis there, right? So now we have identified people in local labor markets who have a high propensity to join SNFs, and we're going to ask, how do you respond to shocks, right? If there's a large demand shock, are you giving up your current career? Or if you're unemployed, are you switching into SNFs?
So this is how we do it. You see again that these people increase their sniff employment. That's consistent with our firm result. That makes sense. More interesting one for the spillovers is, you know, what are these people giving up instead? We don't see any effects on hospital employment or other healthcare employment. So that suggests that um, that's kind of interesting because you do see that being employed in the medical sector in the past is predictive of joining in, this, in SNFs, but this suggests that this margin of switching is just something about your broader career, right? You age and at some point SNF employment becomes attractive to you, but that's not a margin that's elastic to the specific demand shock, right? Who is elastic? The unemployed, right? So unemployment goes down. And um, so this kind of reinforces these findings, suggesting that if you look at these people who are not yet working, what's the margin of adjustment? It's really unemployed that now switch into employment. And that kind of also makes the point that the reform creates jobs. These people would have been unemployed otherwise if they were not hit by these local demand shocks. Are unemployed people people who are also out of the labor force? No, this distinct. This is this thing for the out of the labor force, that's difficult to do in our administrative data because that's not really well collected. These people are currently collecting unemployment benefits, okay? And we can measure them directly. We, uh, yeah. Can they spend years on unemployment? We could do this. Um, we could, I haven't looked at the years yet. Uh, so is that what you're... I'm trying to understand the correlation between being unemployed five years ago. I see. So, I mean, to, to be fair for the system is um, that... Um, yeah, we, um, is, there are very generous long-term unemployment benefits at the time. Uh, actually, this brings me to this point. Germany was known for this, and uh, people have argued that this has contributed to these um, high unemployment rates. And in fact, you know, the House Reform 2005 trying to get at this. Um, but I'll, I'll, we, should, we can do more on this. Um, one thing, let me now reconcile this and talk about friction. So one friction potentially that's relevant here are the unemployment benefits, but more importantly that I want to talk about now are these collective bargaining, right? You know, how is it possible that we see this large increase in employment from lower skilled workers without changing wages? And so that's where these collective bargaining agreements come in. Turns out that public employees in public nursing homes, um, they are paid based on salary scales, right? They're wage tables. They are they're basically vary by age in a very mechanical way. And uh, there has been anecdotal evidence that not-for-profits, largely church-owned providers, follow similar structures, although they differ by region. So we weren't able to develop to find all the contracts that I have. So we'll look at this in the data. Um, and to be clear, these public and not-for-profits, they dominate the market at the time. They comprise about 84% of all inpatient beds. Um, but what's interesting is, I'll come to this, there are a few for-profits in the market too that compete in the same market, but have different, they set their wages differently. So how do they do it differently? Let's look at this. This is the chart. Uh, let's focus on the left uh, figure. Here I'm plotting the log daily wage for full-time workers by worker skills. Here we measured an experience in healthcare years. Okay. So the blue dots here are the for-profits that are not bound by collective bargaining. And the uh, not-for-profits are the ones that do have collective bargaining. I want to emphasize three, three facts here. First, these not-for-profits pay higher wages across the entire skill distribution. Second, uh, you see wage compression. The wages in these not-for-profits vary a lot less by skill, at least when you benchmark it to the for-profits. You see this in the slope. You also see this within an experience level. So this is where these intervals are. The intervals denote the 75th relative to the 25th percentile of the wage by experience level. And you see that these intervals are much larger in these uh, for-profits. Okay, so these, um, we'll later think of those as wedges, think of those as potentially as a competitive benchmark. I'll come back to this later, right? But this kind of illustrates that uh, this, this wage compression, which, uh, which I found at least quite interesting. Um, okay, one other thing that I want to mention is how may this affect employment and hiring? This is uh, captured a little bit by this right graph. Here I'm looking at a share of employees that are employed across these owners um, by um, my experience, and what you see is that these for-profits tend to go a bit more for these lower-skilled workers, whereas the church ones, uh, not for profits, they go for the higher skilled. That makes sense, right? If these for them the lower-skilled workers are super expensive, right? They pay a very large premium relative to the market, so they'd rather cream skim the top if they can. Um, and this also suggests that there may be quite a bit of rationing there, right? There are a lot of lower-skilled workers who work for these uh, for-profits. It's considerably lower wages. So you wonder why aren't they switching to these uh, public nursing, and it's not for profit nursing homes, they pay, you know, 20, more than 20% more. And this suggests that maybe there is rationing, right, going on, that these providers uh, are, um, 
have a queue of workers, right? And um, these wage frictions uh, are a mechanism for that. Okay, let me take stock. Um, I try to, you know, provide a few uh, facts here. I try to argue that uh, this long-term care reform in Germany led to massive employment increases, and the marginal workers are less skilled on average, and we don't find evidence for wage increases. Um, they are largely worked out of a uh, uh, higher of unemployment or out of the labor force. If you go to the aggregate results, there we see this. Um, and then we see from this wage evidence that these not-for-profits pay higher wages, particularly so for lower skilled workers. Okay. The second part, and that's preliminary, so <laughs> jump in with comments and critiques, is uh, we now want to reconcile these, these results through a conceptual framework. We're going to use um, a directed search and matching framework that can reconcile these, uh, these uh, can embed these institutional features and can embed some of these results as equilibrium outcomes. Today, the key objective of this framework is to provide um, sort of sufficient statistics that allow us to match these moments into a welfare number. Okay, that's the key goal today. But I think this, this model is much more general and can be used to study you know, broader industrial policy or place-based policies in, with labor market frictions. Right? Oftentimes, when we think about place-based policies, we have employment gains uh, you know, in mind. So I think these results or this, this approach could be uh, more general. OK, so it's a pretty much standard directed search model. Um, we're going to consider two sectors here. There's going to be a SNF sector populated by not-for-profits. And there's going to be an outside sector. And there are three key building blocks in the model. First, naturally, there are going to be search and matching friction. Um, there's going to be endogenous workforce, people who consider working in SNFs, capital N. Everything is conditional by skill level S. Okay? And among those in the workforce in SNFs, some are job seekers, capital U. Others are already employed. Firms here post vacancies, capital V. Right? These are counts, and so the rates are then little u or little v, which is little u is just capital U divided by n. Now, there's a standard CR, a constant returns to scale matching function, and the labor market tightness theta is an important one that shows kind of the ratio of vacancies over uh, the number of job seekers. So we're going to build in these wage rigidities. I'll, I'll go to this later, the, the unemployment benefits and also collective bargaining. And um, there, we need to take a stand on output markets too. Um, because the subsidy is actually on output. And so here we have a patient demand for, for services and workers produce output. Workers are different in their skills S. And so, you know, worker with type S produce S units of output. For now, we assume um, uh, perfect substitutes in, 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 in production and uh, no scale economies. Um, and so that gives you the, the total output here is just the, the, the product, the joint product and the sum of, uh, of output across these skills that are hired. Um, this one we want to relax. For now, we're going to assume that SNFs are a uh, price taker in, in an output market. Okay, so there are two pretty standard slides now, and now we can just define the value functions. Um, but let me emphasize a few key nuances that we uh, that uh, how we deviate a bit. Starting with the workers, right? There's a value of unemployment. There is B is a standard term, right? There's the flow value of unemployment that includes the unemployment benefits, also value of home production and leisure. The novel part is, is this C part here. This is a preference shock, a preference shock relative to the outside sector, right? So people have just somehow liked to work or search in nursing homes. And this C term enters sort of the value of unemployment, but also employment. Now, people in the unemployed get a slow payoff, and with some probability, they are matched to a job. The probability is, is um, theta times Q of theta. And if they are matched, then they you know, get the value of employment. Then you don't get the B anymore. You just get the wage that's paid. And there's an exogenous separation rate lambda. That's it. Very simple. So for the firms, firms post vacancies, and vacancy post is costly. There's a flow cost of a vacancy. You know, think of this as recruiting and hiring costs. We're going to assume that's proportional to skill, so that's negative here. But with some chance, you're lucky. With Q of theta, that's the job filling rate, um, a vacancy is filled. Okay? And if it is filled, what do these firms get out of it? Well, P is sort of the productivity and uh, scale by per, per unit. So then we scale it by the productivity of the worker minus the wage. So that's sort of the, the, the surplus that goes to the firm. Again, these, these jobs may be broken uh, by this exogenous separation rate, lambda. OK, one thing to highlight is this P here is the price that is received by the firm that may be different from the price that's paid by the patient if there's a price subsidy. That's the tau we come back to this. OK, not-for-profits have this wage posting model. Um, that sort of consists with the fact sort of there's an intercept and some slope in skills. Okay, with that we can characterize the steady state equilibrium. First two conditions are standard. 
standard beverage curve equating you know inflows and outflows out of unemployment, standard job creation curve, um, the, the free energy condition, you can always post vacancies until the value, the marginal value is zero. The new parts are these two lower equations, eight and nine. Here is sort of the worker mobility, okay? So these workers in the model, they, they decide where to search. Should they search in the outside sector that gives you utility ZS, or should they search in sniff sector? The worker with this cutoff here is indifferent. That's the marginal worker. He is just indifferent between these two sectors. And what is he trading off? The ZS from the outside sector vis-a-vis -vis what he would get in the sniff sector. And that depends on the wages he would get. And obviously also on the rate of success. How likely is it that he finds a job? Everybody with XC higher than XC lower bar prefers sniffs strictly. And below, they're going to go in the outside sector. These, this is the marginal indifferent worker. Yeah? Just clarification. So do you have both uh, for-profit and non-profit farms? Only not for profits for now. So this is a good extension. Let's come uh, come to this uh, um, hopefully afterwards. Yeah. For now, let's think of this as a market with just with not for profits. We get dominating the market. Yeah. And then the product market clears demand equals supply. Here is sort of where the subsidy comes in. Okay. All right. With that in mind, what we're going to move to our key object of interest, which is welfare and how it responds to a product subsidy. Okay. Welfare here is just the value of output of productive workers to the extent that is valued the output by consumers. We're also going to add the, um, the unemployment benefits, so the, the flow value of unemployed among the unemployed workers. And we need to net out the hiring costs in steady state that are needed to maintain um, employment. And we're going to net out the utility from the outside sector. Here, the second part are these preference shocks. And then there are public spending externalities, right? You see here that these unemployment benefits, they're good for the workers, but they're expensive for the government. And that's sort of what's captured here by public spending. OK. Let's move to the heart, right? We are interested, how does S move if we introduce this product subsidy, OK? And so in the model, it operates through two channels, right? First of all, there's going to be potentially endogenous relocation between sectors. Um, people may move from the outside sector towards SNFs, although that's not something we see empirically. And second, there's going to be relocation within sector, right? Even holding the workforce fixed, it could be that nursing homes now post more vacancies, and that's going to lower the unemployment rate. If you work out the mass, um, you're going to arrive at three terms. Okay, the, These three terms, it's summed over skill levels, and it's just the integral path over the subsidy. It has three key parts. The first one is the standard uh, Harberger triangle. That's the triangle that weight loss in the product market. If I introduce a product subsidy, people be, be consume beyond the initial willingness to pay. That's standard. Here's a fiscal externality. And here's the interesting part. That's the labor market surplus that is driven by these wedges. Okay, so. Few things. The labor market surplus is not driven by relocation between sectors. Why is that? In this model, the workforce is actually efficient because of an envelope condition. These workers are indifferent between the sectors, so the marginal worker is indifferent. That means that if people did switch between sectors in this model, it would only enter through this uh, dead weight, traditional deadweight loss or the fiscal externalities, but not the labor market surplus. What does it depend on? Holding the, the workforce fixed, it depends on changes in the tightness, in the theta. So potentially, as firms post more vacancies, and so then the unemployment rate uh, uh, may fall or increase. What does it depend on? The sign is that a good or bad thing? That depends on the wage wedges. Okay, so this is the heart of the of, of this analysis: is the the wage wedge WS? That's the wage that's actually paid by these not-for-profits, and it may be different than the efficient wage. Okay. What is the efficient wage? It turns out it has the following structure. That would be the wage that would arise in a competitive surge equilibrium. Okay? So what you see here is a version of a hosier's condition. right? If the model was Nash bargaining and uh, the workers bargaining rate better would be the elasticity of the matching function alpha, then you would get the wages equal the efficient wage. right? That's the standard hosier's condition. So we have a version of this. Um, which benchmarks the actual wage to the efficient wage, right? And so what's happening here? If the workers get too paid too much, right? If they extract too many rents, then the, the providers will underinvest in vacancies, right? And that unemployment rate will be inefficiently high. It can also go the other way around. It could be that these wages are too low, in which case the firms post too many vacancies and that's going to construct uh, congestion externalities on others. Yeah? Just a clarification. I'm really confused about your wage setting. So the, my understanding is that standard wage is much more than Usually, like, we do the exchange allocation. So that, uh, so that was a prediction by form and other. So I, I just want to make sure what is an assumption. So it seems like your weight yeah. assumption is different from the 
Exactly, exactly. We are assuming that these not for profits differ. They don't post the efficient wage, they just have some protocol based on this collective bargaining here. And it may or may not be the efficient wage that arises in, in equilibrium. So the, the reason here if you when you would emphasize the effective charge is more like you want to say or skills they cover all the sub skill specific sub labor market. Yeah. And so, but that's absolutely right. The Mohan result will give you this, and it might be the case that these for-profits, it is not for-profits, post different wages. Okay, so here is a graphical illustration of this in a simple case. If you set sort of alpha, the uh, matching less to zero, the congestion externalities away, you assume homogeneous skills and the you know, vacancy cost is C, then these, these welfare effects have a very intuitive graphical illustration, right? This, demand, this is the old demand curve, and this is the wage, the very high wage posted by these not-for-profits. So the former equilibrium is at point A, where the marginal cost, wage plus the hiring cost, equal the price. Um, and now what you do is you introduce a, a product subsidy that shifts out demand. So your equilibrium moves from A to A prime. The standard textbook model would say that's a bad thing because here's a dead weight loss, A, A prime C. But that overlooks the fact that wages may be inefficiently high. In this model, in this simplified model, the efficient wage would actually be uh, the B term, which is the value of unemployment, um, the flow rate of unemployment. And so what you see then is that there's a wedge in this, in, this, in, uh, in, this, in, this, in this labor market, and employment in the first place is inefficiently low, right? So that means that the total welfare loss is not just as AA prime C, you also need to add this, 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 this gain here in the labor market surplus in the areas AA prime B, B prime. There's a second externality because of these unemployment benefits, if we create jobs, the government saves unemployment benefits, and that adds an extra box, B, B prime, D, D prime. And so the total welfare loss, once you take these frictions and input market into account, is not just this dead weight loss term, it's also these two boxes case capture these, these uh, frictions in the labor market. Okay, 10 minutes. Oh, wow, okay. All right, so measurement. Uh, last thing, and I'm... Um, Last thing, now we want to uh, put numbers on this. Um, so the unemployment changes, we can measure directly in the data. Uh, those are the, our diff and diff estimates. If you assume um, perfect competition output market, you can get at these prices by marginal cost, which is wages plus the hiring costs. Hiring costs are been estimated to be about 15% of the wage. So we can plug that in. And um, unemployment rates we see too. The key part is how do we measure these wedges? Right? We do see the wages that are actually paid by these not-for-profits. But the thought experiment, what would be the efficient wage based on Moen that would arise in a competitive search equilibrium? And so here we propose two solutions. One, is to, um, one idea is to just look at the few for-profits that are in the market and argue that you know, they, they provide a similar uh, output service, but they're not bound to collective bargaining. Potentially, they provide a reasonable proxy for these uh, competitive wages that would arise. That's true. Then we're basically measuring these wedges that I showed early in this daily wages between for-profits and not-for-profits. And another approach would be we can also take uh, counterfactual wages that people would earn in, in other sectors um, as a benchmark. So these are the two approaches that we do for now. We don't see this W star directly. Obviously, if you specify the model, uh, estimated all the structural parameters, you could back it out. But otherwise, we would like to have some a direct version. So right now, we just uh, approximate it by the wages of the for-profits or wages in other sectors. Um, we are still working on refining on this. But it turns out that if you scale these, it first looks that this traditional dead weight loss may be a bad thing, right? Uh, that, um, of course, um, the dead weight loss here is, is negative. But they are two offsetting lar potentially large effects, either because we save unemployment benefits or because um, this labor market surplus. And they may offset this, and then on net, this policy may actually be welfare enhancing in a second, uh, in a second best sense. Okay, that's it. Um, I probably went a bit too fast, but uh, sorry, I would run out of time. So, um, right, so the, the facts stand for itself, right? We've uh, documented these large employment effects. To our surprise, we didn't see much changes in wages. One, the explanation that we put forward are that there are these uh, wage collective bargaining agreements that are just fixed in time. And um, what they do is they impose basically a very high wage ceiling or wage level, sorry, not ceiling, very high wage level for the lower skilled workers. So there's going to be a lot of um, queuing basically of, uh, of unemployed workers for these jobs. And so firms could very easily expand employment without changing wages because they overpay in the first place. Um, we um, 
yeah, these workers are the, the marginal were less skilled and come from uh, non-employment, and um, yeah, and so these 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 frictions in the labor markets that we've captured um, provided some evidences, provided an explanation for those, and uh, when you incorporate those, this long-term care subsidy that looks bad in a partial equilibrium sense because of a dead weight loss could be actually efficient in a second best sense if you uh, incorporate these these wedges in in this in these input markets. Good. So I was very happy to be assigned uh, this paper. Actually, in many countries, uh, there's a lot of discussion of uh, potential reform packages for long-term care uh, insurance, in particular in Canada, so looking at expansion of, uh, of coverage. Um, so actually, an alternative interesting motivation for the paper, which I think is very different from the German context, is that at the time, is that nowadays most countries contemplating the introduction of a system like this are in labor shortages. And one of the main drawbacks or main break on any introduction of a system is actually that it's not clear we have the workers to actually fund this. So I think this is a, a different angle, but I think of the results here are of interest also to that, uh, that sort of, uh, of uh, discussion. Now, the, the first, um, so it was very interesting to dig back into the German reform. I had read it a long time ago, you know, what happened and how it happened. Uh, but um, uh, I think the first comment I want to make is on the normative framework. Um, I think there is a missing piece, which is not damaging to the paper because I think the novelty is looking at the labor market effect. But there is an implicit assumption here, which is that uh, we're starting from a benchmark where all the insurance is going to do or the subsidies to push us away from what would be socially optimal. While many of us working in this field from the demand side start from the assumption that we're actually in a world where there's several imperfections or market imperfections, uh, which means that if we're going to expand long-term care insurance, this is actually, there's a lot of value created, for example, from allowing people to insure against the financial risk associated with long-term care. So I think in your uh, normative framework or the the, uh, the the form the the formulas that you have for the welfare change. I think you're missing a first term, which is what's the value of the insurance to consumers. And so, in this standard sort of arrow or new house framework, you'd be weighting when you introduce an insurance scheme. You'd be weighting the value of the insurance uh, to the moral hazard effect. And 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 sort of very often in the introduction of such, such schemes, the insurance value would be very large. So that doesn't take anything away, uh, but perhaps the this, this sort of starting off from, you know, a negative effect if we don't assume any labor market uh, effects is probably, um, you know, incomplete uh, in the discussion. Uh, the second thing is that moral hazard in long-term care is slightly different than in a regular healthcare setting. Uh, there's the assessment of care needs. Uh, there's actually relatively strict control on and who gets what and, and what they get. And, and so I think some discussion of the relevant literature on moral hazard in a nursing home setting would be perhaps more relevant than say the REN health insurance experiment setting, which where I think the issues are slightly different. So uh, that's the uh, first thing. Now, I always like to pause for a minute on just you know the overall numbers before we get into uh, complex regressions. And if we just look at the evolution of um, number of workers over time, uh, with the introduction in 1995 of the uh, of the uh, the insurance expansion, um, you know it's 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 harder to see a really big ramp up of employment in that sector uh, in, with the introduction. Now you could say, well, perhaps we don't know what's the counterfactual. Maybe it would have been trending down, or maybe it would have, you know. So we don't know the counterfactual. So here, when we just look at this, we don't seem to s see overall in the aggregate a very large increase in the employment in the skilled uh, nursing home facility. So this was puzzling to me. And I went back to read on the reform. And actually, if you look four years after introduction, uh, seven person out of 10 who was recipient of uh, that subsidy was actually in a home care setting. Lots of people in informal care, uh, most people at home, potentially purchasing some services. So it's actually not clear uh, overall that the reform had such a big effect on nursing home facilities. If you look at the total outlays, only 44% of total outlays of the program is on benefits paid for uh, institutionalized care. 
Uh, so, so that's you know we're thinking about and, and and thinking how do we how do we frame that. Now the same if we split by groups because obviously now we're going to differentiate by low exposure versus high exposure based on pre-reform level of the uh, take up of the means testing program. And actually the other thing that is interesting and I find this interesting is that actually and the lines are from me from my notes on the PDF. Um, you know, the, the sort of the group that is highly exposed, um, you know, preform, you sort of see the trend just ramping up linearly, no change at the, at the, in 1995. And it's actually the group that is breaking is actually the low exposure group. Uh, and it's breaking downwards, uh, which is sort of interesting because it's the group that is supposed not, not to be affected less uh, from the program. Um, so, you know, when the diff-and-diff diff models are going to pick up an effect, and obviously they will, um, it's unclear here that it's from, that whether this, this is from the effect of the program on the highest exposure group or whether there's something else going on with the low exposure group, maybe some shifting across lenders in Germany or across different regions uh, in terms of workers and, and where they are. Uh, and, uh, and so this, this also is worth uh, thinking about. Another thing which was very interesting is when we look at firms, um, we, the paper is mostly focused on the 1995 change, but there's actually a really, really big change happening somewhere in 1999 where both series completely break uh, and they break downwards. And, um, you know, I, I didn't have a really clear explanation as to, in the paper as to why this was the case. I could only conjecture reading on the reform. But it seems that uh, a lot of these firms has re had really a hard time recruiting, in particular, nurses uh, in that period. There's a lot of discussion uh, uh, among um, policymakers at that time as to whether or not they're actually able to staff the increased demand, especially in nursing homes. Uh, and so when we think of uh, skilled workers here in nursing home in particular, it wasn't clear to me whether we were talking about nurses or we were talking about uh, nursing assistants and so on, so you might want to uh, think about that, but but this is very interesting from the IO perspective, uh, potentially as well, so why is it the case that suddenly we have a, you know, we have a break uh, in the series. Now there's other effects, I said GE here, but, you know, you know, we can think of them in very different ways. Actually, there's a number of papers, I posted the link here, but there's a number of papers that show that the reform um, actually led a lot of uh, people to actually stay at home as carers uh, following, you know, 1995. So people who left employment uh, because the reform actually had a benefit in it that was actually to compensate carers who stayed at home. Um, and so this, I think, is interesting to think about because this is impacting the composition of employment as well at the same time. So. There might be ways to deal with that or to look at that, but there seems to be going, you know, other, other transitions in the transition matrix seem to be impacted by, by the reform. Now, the, uh, the payroll taxes that were introduced, um, you know, to fund uh, this, um, obviously, um, th there's a lot of redistribution going on uh, in there. In particular, I found very interesting how the, um, how the contribution of employers was introduced. It was actually... Uh, that uh, employers didn't want necessarily this reform to go through. This would have mean for them an increase in payroll taxes. So they negotiated with unions actually the elimination of one, pay, one paid holiday uh, in Germany for workers in order to fund this. And that pretty much funded the, the change. Um, and so this is a pure incidence effect, right? In terms of the hourly wage of workers, uh, they get one less uh, paid uh, holiday uh, uh, for the same wage, and so if we measure hourly wage, uh, uh, this potentially changes. And the incidence, as we know, depends on demand and supply elasticity. So how did that play out across lenders or across regions? Uh, this is uh, another thing to think about. Um, it's also not just an insurance expansion when we go and read on what happened in 1995. Uh, the federal government in Germany uh, had a program from 1991 to 1998 to actually invest in LTC infrastructure, so actually build nursing homes. So when we interpret all of this in terms of an insurance expansions, yes, it is partly, but there's also other programs uh, 
uh, being implemented, uh, which makes sense, obviously, because as you introduce an insurance scheme, uh, you're also going to need facilities. And so they invested quite a bit. There was a little bit more than 400 uh, construction or renovation projects uh, introduced during that time. In uh, 1995, 70,000 employment opportunities created for nurses. So this was also a specific federal program. Um, and actually, there's a lot of discussion, as I read from this paper here, which is actually was very interesting. Um, um, a lot of discussion, uh, they, apparently there was a lot of trouble filling those spots. Uh, so a lot of slack there or a lot of difficulty uh, f filling those, those positions. So things to think about, and, but I think it's an extremely rich reform, extremely rich framework. There's a lot happening. It's of extremely high relevance to other countries. So your research, I think, you know, I'm going to be following updates of this paper because, um, in fact, uh, there's very little literature on what happens in the market for workers uh, working in the LTC sector as we reform uh, LTC insurance. And so I think you're opening up a novel sort of branch of research uh, on this, which is uh, very uh, interesting. Um, and as I said, it's, it's very relevant in today's context where we're more in a context of labor shortages. Um, and this is, uh, for example, here in Quebec and Canada, this is actually the biggest downside that we get anytime we talk about expansion is you guys don't have the workers to actually fill those positions. So again, are we talking about immigration policies targeted towards healthcare workers? Uh, uh, how does this work in terms of substitution across sectors? So if we pay bonuses to get people into the nursing home sector, uh, nurses, are we stealing them from hospitals <laughs> and therefore creating a problem elsewhere? Uh, so I think this is uh, very interesting. So thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss the paper. It was actually a very, very nice paper. Thank you.